Hi everyone, I think we'll get started now. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to our third day of Theories in Action, the Senior Exchange. Uh, my name is Meg, I'm one of the senior uh, coordinators of the conference at the CRC, along with Alexis Rodriguez Camacho and Jean Peggy Chang. Um, we have over 65 seniors participating this year, and Theories in Action is meant to serve as an introspective space for seniors to reflect on their academic and co-curricular activities and share with each other and also with you guys as the audience. Uh, we have paper copies of the schedule, which runs until Saturday on the back table over here, and also you can visit our website at brownta.org for the full schedule. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Jen Seinfeld, joining us from the Square Center. And um, the title of our presentation, of their presentation today, is Moving Beyond Health Inequality. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I think I'm just going to turn it directly over to each of you who have worked out uh, individual presentations, and then uh, we'll have a panel discussion and then some QA at the end. So please think of your questions. So, Sarah, do you want to yeah. begin? Hi, I'm Sage Finuki Funes, and I'm a senior in American Studies and Gender and Sexuality Studies. Cool. Hi, I'm Sarah. I also go by Shu. I'm a senior from Los Angeles, and I'm concentrating in sociology. I work primarily with people who are experiencing homelessness and people who are incarcerated. So that's my main focus. My name is Ryan. I use they, them, their pronouns. I'm a senior in neuroscience. I'm a caseworker at Hasbro Children's Hospital. And I also hope to do trauma informed psychiatry for trans kids. Hi, I'm Stephanie Kaufman. I'm a senior studying medical anthropology and contemplative studies. Um, I founded Project Let's and focus on peer support services for students with disabilities. <coughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Nancy. I'm a senior studying health and human biology and ethnic studies. Um, my thesis is looking at Vietnamese nail salon workers in the Bay Area, so bridging health and labor organizing uh, literature. Uh, and I use she or they them their pronouns. Um, hi, my name is V. I'm a senior uh, studying international relations in Latin American Caribbean studies. Uh, my thesis looks at the politics of our HIV AIDS in Cuba. Cool. Um, I'm going to start. Oh, 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 clarifying question. So you guys are in a different order than you gave me. Do you want to go in this order or do you want to go in the written order? This order. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you. Um, yeah, also a quick note, we were going to have everyone hold their questions till the end. Um, I don't know if that was said. Anyway, hello. Um, so my thesis is titled, Can We Just Have the Babies? An Analysis of Midwifery in Rhode Island and the Treatment of Low-Income Patients and Patients of Color. Um, my work explores midwifer the midwifery model of care and how that care assists people of color and low-income people throughout pregnancy and birth. So a midwife is a medical provider that, provide, that views birth as a normal physiological process. Uh, midwives are often viewed as a medical provider that works outside of the medicalization paradigm of birth. This paradigm views pregnancy and birth as a pathology that must be treated. I knew early on in my undergraduate studies that I wanted to become a midwife. I was interested in the way in which midwives navigated the hospital and provided a birth experience that centered the patient's wants and needs. Spring semester of my junior year, I began working at Women and Infants Hospital. Overwhelmingly, I was in rooms of all white providers, and many of the patients were patients of color and or low income. I wondered how this dynamic affected the quality of care they were receiving. Um, so, oops, I let's get to the next one, sorry. Um, so my research questions. The majority of midwives in Rhode Island self-identify as white. Nationally, only 2% of midwives are black. It is astonishing how low these numbers are. Before the advent of the nurse midwife in the 1940s, black granny midwives, immigrant women, and indigenous midwives made up a majority of birth attendants in the United States. What do these numbers mean for patients who identify as something other than white to not see their faces reflected? Does this limit a midwife's ability to provide the best care for the most vulnerable patient populations? How does race and income contribute to the ways in which some patients are treated? How does a midwife's personal identities affect their ability to provide care to patients unlike themselves? My method relies heavily on ethnographic research techniques. I feel that an ethnography would provide an important insight into the complexities of midwifery care in Rhode Island. 
Before I move on to my research, I feel it is important to note um, the use of woman as a term in my thesis. I want to acknowledge that not all pregnant people identify as women, yet the language most providers and medical research use is highly gendered. And a lot of my interviewees and field research reflects how gendered language is ingrained into medical practice. For the sakes of this presentation, I've divided my research into two sections um, to give you sort of a sample of what uh, research I did. So my first is in, um, shared a shared decision-making model, and my second is um, about race and experiences of racism. So one of the tenets of midwifery is implementing a shared decision-making model. The model is defined as a collaborative process between patients and providers that takes in the best available evidence to decide on benefits and risks of procedures and takes into account a patient's values and preferences. A shared decision-making model rests on accepting that individual self-determination is a desirable goal and that clinicians need to support patients to achieve that goal whenever feasible. Yet research shows that many providers, while they're aware of a shared decision-making model, don't actually know how to implement this model. Take this quote, for example, that a midwife said to me in an interview. She said, when you have an idea of something that might be healthiest or best for somebody, and they have a different idea of what they want to do, and when you can't reconcile those things, I would say, as a medical provider, it is not hard to convince people to do things that I think they should do. Like, if I think they should do something, I can, like, if I wanted to, I can probably find the words that would make them think it is very important to do the thing I want them to do. You can find the words, the scary words, to make someone do something. And I think finding the balance between not being coercive but giving information is important to help them make the healthiest decision. She does not view this tactic as coercive, but it seems at times she falls victim to the very trap that she wanted to work against when she first became a midwife. This same midwife told me at the beginning of our conversation that she became a midwife because she was a feminist and wanted to provide women-centered care. Almost every midwife I spoke to at one point mentioned wanting to center patients' needs or their feminist beliefs, but then went on to contradict these values. I can't disregard the, the expertise that midwives have in their field. They go through years of training and schooling. The conflict here is how midwives approach the tension between what a patient wants and what they might need. Expertise at times can trump a patient's desire for a certain labor experience, but a shared decision model, making model might lead to better transparency between the provider and the patient. Translation and language can be another barrier to implementing a shared decision-making model. One midwife, Natalie, tells me she has an advantage because she can speak multiple language. She says, lots of her patients were Cape Verdean, and I'm Cape Verdean, so I spoke Creole, which is a derivative of Portuguese, not Spanish, and I speak Spanish. My Spanish became quite fluent, actually. I sp also spoke Portuguese. It was great being there and helping them and seeing women come who had never had health care. I could identify with them culturally and they trusted me, which is a big thing. Especially when you are an immigrant and you don't speak much English and instead of having an interpreter, which takes away from what you can gain from them, like their history and whatnot, but when they can trust you, they come to you and they are pretty open. Natalie is able to rely on her own fluency, which many men I spoke to can't do. Um, now I'm gonna move on to my next section. So what about racism in the medical system? Do midwives alleviate or perpetuate situations like one example I'm about to tell you about a patient, this patient who I interviewed faced. So this is, her name is Marie and she remembers how scared she was following her C-section. She says, I must have fallen asleep, but that 45 minutes of not being able to remember what happened to me is the worst. Probably the basis of my postpartum depression later, and it was traumatizing because I didn't know, given the stupid lady's question before going under this, a midwife had asked her if she wanted to the litigation right before she went into her C-section. It was like nobody was with me and I was by myself and asleep. I had no idea what they had done. I had no idea if they had done something horrible to me because they couldn't account for the time and nobody who loved me was in the room. It's obvious that Marie feared that she too, like many women who look like her, would be sterilized without her mission. This violence should not have to cross the mind of any patient during labor. Her story is not a singular incident. Two women of color have also shared with me similar experiences they had at Women in Infants Hospital. One woman asked if she would like her tubes tied during her C-section while it was be being performed on her. Another brought up that woman's experience during one of her prenatal visits with her midwife and her midwife defended that question. This experience led her to switch midwifery practices six months into her pregnancy. 
These conversations should not be had during labor. If a patient wants permanent or long-term acting forms of birth control, these conversations need to be had prior and should be noted in their chart. Patients cannot feasibly give informed consent while under the stress of having emergency C-section or really at all during labor. Considering the legacy of forced sterilization of women of color, consent is not an issue that should be taken lightly. No person should be worried during labor of what they might, or that they might be forcibly sterilized. People of color, especially black people, are routinely denied dignity and respect in their pregnancy and labor. Can a midwifery model of care interject or disrupt this? Some concluding thoughts. Pregnancy and childbirth are complex. Yet for most, it is the most intimate times of their lives. Midwives have the privilege of working closely with their patients and encouraging them throughout their pregnancy and labor. Everyone deserves a birthing experience filled with respect, encouragement, and acknowledgement, not just of their anatomy or autonomy, but also their ability to parent a newborn. Not everyone is afforded this experience. Labor is not depoliticized. It's far from that. Most patients are not given this experience within our healthcare system because racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, and ability structure the way in which hospitals run. Midwives can, at times, fight for their patients' autonomy and voice in a system that routinely overlooks these values. Instilling the value of self-determination is incredibly important in creating a space where a person feels like their parenting decisions are val valid and they can care for their children. Birth has the potential to be a moment free of those forces that continually tell us that black lives don't matter. Midwives have the capacity to create a space where black lives and livelihood do matter. Currently, black women are almost four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications, and black babies are almost are twice as likely to die before their first birthday than white babies. Black lives matter. We must begin to affirm life and hum humanity at birth. Midwives are just one piece of a very large puzzle. Many midwives in Providence share this value, yet medical bureaucracy and internalized racism can limit their ability to provide care that affirms people who are marginalized. The birth community in Providence is making steps towards this justice more and more. Midwives of color are beginning to practice. More and more conversations are starting to be had. So hopefully one day, people can just have their babies. Um, I just want to give a quick thanks to my thesis advisor, Debbie Weinstein, my reader, Felicia Salinas Moniz and a huge thanks to all the midwives I interviewed and patients, and also a big thank you to Dr. Beth Cronin and Liz Howard for being my mentors within the hospital. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sage. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about the work I've done over the past year and a half regarding prisoners' health in Rhode Island. Uh, this work ended up becoming my capstone project for sociology. Um, so it ended up summing into this fancy title um, called um, Improving Prisoners' Health in Rhode Island, um, a two-front educational intervention to reduce barriers to prisoners' health. So before I explain what this means and the work that I did, I'll give you a quick rundown about what prisoners' health means, um, particularly in Rhode Island. Um, and why addressing barriers to prisoners' health is incredibly complex. So first, 95% of all people who are incarcerated will return back to their communities. So prisoners' health is community health. However, people who are incarcerated um, face disproportionately high rates of health issues, in particular substance abuse, uh, mental illness, and communicable diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C. This is because those who are incarcerated are dis disproportionately from lower income uh, communities of color who are already medically underserved. Let's also keep in mind that the US is home to the largest prison population in the world and has the highest um, per capita uh, incarceration rate in the world as well. So using a systems level analysis, thank you to my social degree for that, <laughs> uh, I looked at prisoners' health as a system and from there, I mapped out the barriers to adequate healthcare and healthcare access that prisoners face in Rhode Island. And specifically, I found that there were three types of barriers. So really quickly, um, the first is institutional barriers. So this includes organizations like the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, um, the, let's say, the social uh, NGOs that um, are present in the communities that they are from and are returning to. And so the barriers that exist there include um, lack of funding, lack of personnel, 
um, and a general lack of organizations dedicated to improving prisoners' health and the social determinants of health. Um, secondly, there are legal and political barriers. Um, so in general, there are laws and rules in place that prevent um, people who have been previously incarcerated from accessing stable housing, um, employment, and in turn, this leads to um, people engaging in behaviors and you put them at high risk for different um, health issues. Um, so I think I put there that there are unjust laws and just general discrimination within the criminal justice system that we have to address. Um, and thirdly, there are ideological barriers. Um, so this includes the knowledge that incarcerated individuals have about health. Um, this also includes self-stigma. So a lot of people who are afraid of disclosing their status as someone who has been incarcerated don't reach out to health professionals. Um, and in, in addition, there's public stigma. So public stigma um, is sort of the stigma that exists around incarceration. There are stereotypes that people who are incarcerated are just lazy, they, they messed up, they did something wrong, um, they don't deserve the same access that we do. Cool. So knowing this, I worked on two educational curricula to kind of target these three barriers. So the first one is um, an edu educational curriculum at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. I'll just call it RIDOC. Um, that was started a year and a half ago um, with my roommate. Um, incarcerated individuals uh, face an increased risk of contracting HIV within the first 30 days of release. Um, due to the hardships of re-entering um, society and the pressures of you know, rekindling um, you know, family relations and um, finding, finding health uh, care, housing, and employment, um, individuals are sometimes forced into behaviors that put them at high risk of contracting HIV such as sharing needles um, or practicing unsafe sex. Luckily though, there is this new regimen called PrEP, pre-exposure -expo pre prophylaxis. It's, um, it's a once a day pill that you can take that prevents you, prevents you from contracting HIV by up to 92%. It also costs um, $8,000 to $14,000 a year. Um, but there is a drug company that produces this called Gilead that actually has a medication assistance program to provide PrEP for free for anyone without health insurance. Um, so what we decided to do um, was to create a system at the RIDOC such that these individuals can actually access PrEP before release. Because um, in a focus group, we realized that it was really unlikely for them to go to the STD clinic after being released and find out more information about whether they are at high risk or if they're eligible. So to do that, we created a 15-minute educational curriculum that is integrated into an opioid overdose class that is mandatory for um, all individuals before they are released from the RIDOC. It's also currently being integrated into a health class taught by Nurse Deborah Davis. Um, so this curriculum ends with a short survey um, with an interest form where they can privately and secretly indicate whether they would like to talk to a healthcare professional at the RIDOC about whether um, they would be eligible for PrEP and whether they can actually get a free supply. Um, this curriculum also contains a pamphlet that we made. Um, I think it should be here. Yeah. Um, so this kind of helps them navigate um, the STD clinic after release um, kind of sums down everything that's in the curriculum, and so even if they don't get prep within the prison, um, they can access it pretty easily um, through this pamphlet. Um, I also help the medical program there create sort of like a computer testing program um, that can actually test HIV risk and prep eligibility. So this computer screening program is being rolled out this month. Um, and it will be given to all inmates coming into the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. So we are targeting both people exiting um, the system right now as well as people coming in. So basically this curriculum addresses kind of the institutional barriers to health um, as well as the self-stigma that prevents a lot of inmates from reaching out. Um, cool, so uh, part two, um, it's a prisoner's health elective at Blackstone Academy. Um, Blackstone Academy is a high school, it's a charter school, and this was created in conjunction with um, Mr. Victor Ha, who's a graduate of Brown's MAT program and a new teacher at Blackstone. Um, this particular high school was an ideal location because the school, um, it's really cool, it combines activism with scholarship, um, but also most of their students are low-income students of color, and many of them have had experience with the criminal justice system. 
So this course meets um, once a week for about two hours, mm -hmm. um, and any student grades 9th through 12th through twelfth grade um, can register for the course. Um, and the goal of the course was to provide students with the working knowledge of um, incarceration, race, prisoners' health, and the avenues that they can use to change, um, to make the change that they want to see. Um, so this class also includes a field trip to the RIDOC to actually talk to inmates. Um, last semester we went actually to Men's Maximum Security and they got to talk to a lot of the inmates there. Uh, we also took them to Harvest Kitchen, uh, which employs uh, youth at the juvenile corrections um, to teach them about you know, interviewing skills as well as um, the food service industry. And so the first iteration of this course was run successfully from August of last year to January of this year. And we're currently teaching a second cohort of students um, right now. And this course will end in June. Um, so yeah, this is sort of trying to address like the legal and political barriers by teaching kids sort of the, the action-based um, civic engagement tools that they need to make change at a governmental level. All right, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, this is just a really brief and quick overview of the curriculum, um, but if you have any questions later, um, feel free to ask. Great, so it's unsurprising that for a talk on health and equality that there's going to be a lot of heavy content. So before we go on, I kind of see people's faces in the audience, and I see people faces being kind of murky. So let's all take a deep breath. Before we go on. Great. So I'm going to be, one of the themes that I want to address at the very beginning that I think will be great for an overarching in the panel is how the theory that's crafted within academic institutions then goes on directly and indirectly to inform um, policy creation and the practice within different institutions. So the practice within um, carceral systems such as prisons, <laughs> within um, the medical system, which is what I'm specifically going to talk about. So as I've been coming into my gender transition, I've noticed that there is just supreme lack of access to trans healthcare. Um, and that kind of varies by geographic location, of course, and within certain scenarios. Um, persons like Caitlyn Jenner, who have financial access, will be more likely to find networks that give them access to treatment. But across the board, there are these restrictions still set in place that don't make sense to people. So for example, um, in order to get access to hormones or surgeries, oftentimes they require trans folks to have a psychiatric referral. Sometimes um, you, a person needs to have seen a psychiatrist for up to a year in order to get said referral. So you have folks that are going in to get on hormones and are really excited, and then um, the endocrinologist will be like, okay, where's your psychiatrist referral? And if that's a low-income trans person that isn't within an insurance that where they can have access to a psychiatrist, they may be barred from hormones because they can't afford to pay a person to say that they are mentally sound within psychiatric practice. So, um, I've been trying to really dig into the theory that I think informs this practice of um, trans people being labeled still as stigmatized, as mentally ill. Gender dysphoria is still a diagnosis within the fifth iteration of the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, and it functions to give people access to um, trans healthcare. And I really do think that in years to come, it will be incorporated into pediatrics, and it will be routine questions that um, pediatricians know to ask adolescents and toddlers about their gender, and I don't think hormones will as be, be as big of a, a rigmarole in, in years to come. And I think we will look back on trans people having to prove that they are mentally sound before getting access to life-affirming and life-saving care. So, some of the theory that I've been analyzing and wanting to dig into Oh, it looks like Bruce is up there. Okay, we're gonna yeah, we just, skip ahead yeah. to. Just, yeah, just go through my side. I'm good. Great. <laughs> um, when I'm a neuroscience concentrator, when I came into, into a neuroscience freshman year, there is one lecture they used to do at the end that was kind of like the, the sex lecture, where they're talking about sex and the way the sex is constructed in the brain. And I really did realize that. Um, the neuroscience department here is, is cutting edge. The professors here write the textbook that is used across the country, and I realized that even within some of the leading neuroscientists um, who are teachers in the field, that there is this inherent understanding that the brain is sexually dimorphic, that it is two different kinds, and that persons are born, and there is some sort of process whereby hormones um, uh, function to create their brain as inherently male or female. Um, and 
the way that neuroscience then goes on to talk about um, alterations to this model, like for example, people who have queer sexuality, is that there are exceptions to the rule, and we need to find brain structures that um, you know underlie this difference in sexuality, and not even touching on um, gender variation yet, because that's not something that can be accounted for. Who knows what that is? So I, as I've proceeded through neuroscience, I saw an article that came out this last year, I believe, where a neuroscientist uh, published this publication where she was starting to find huge evidence of fluidity within the way that the brain underwrites gender. Um, the specific study, which is this one, and I'm going to walk us through it. Um, oh, it looks like my slides didn't make it in. That's OK. Um, we can reload it. I'll keep talking about this Basically, what these slides show is this, this woman. I didn't put her name on the figure, so I should credit her. Her name is Daphne Joelle. Um, she did a fMRI scan of about 700 to 800 brains. And she did a comparison where she pinpointed the regions of the brain that have been seen to be sexually dimorphic, to be different between men and women. So you can see the, the top part, in figure C, she's pinpointing the parts of the brains that are seen to be different in men and women. And then she put it into a bivariate comparison model where she took the parts of the brain that tend to be bigger in men, so that's on the red side, um, and the parts of the brain that tend to be smaller in women. And she kind of put them into this bigger and smaller 33% model. And figure E, um, every vertical row represents a different brain region. Every horizontal row represents a different brain. Pink and blue correspond to female-sized or male-sized brain regions. So you can see within the female and male-sized columns that within any specific brain, there are many different brains that um, are within this middle region where they aren't developed as male or female. There are many brains that show both kinds of male and female traits. There are some brains in the male region that show pretty male-sized brain um, size across the board, but within this specific population of range, which is very, very large, you see a huge heterogeneity in the way that sex linked traits are described. So, I personally would like to see neuroscience more understand the way that brains developed as heterogeneous, that um, there is neuroscience that underwrites gender variance and gender fluidity. and. The evidence is there. The exciting thing about neuroscience is that there's new and developing research that um, appears every year. And this is relatively new, but um, in order for this to be understood and to really move into medical practice, um, medical providers need to interrogate the way that they've come to understand gender and sex as these static things that um, proceed from each other. So a model of understanding gender, sex, and sexuality that um, I've been coming to use is gender and sex as a three-ply yarn that they do interrelate and they do interact with each other, but they are separate strands in the way that they function. So for a trans person, um, they do consider their gender to be very separate from their sex often. A lot of trans people do expender, um, experience gender dysphoria. However, um, a person does not, a trans person does not develop their gender solely to better experience their sex. Their gender is a different experience. At the same time, a person's sexuality does not inherently stem from their sex. It can be a different thing that operates and change and is itself fluid over time. These things do interrelate, but they don't follow from each other logically in this model of when a person is born this, and then has to be this gender, and then has to have a sexuality that proceeds and fits into our heterosexual conception of how bodies should be. So um, this is the research I, I've been doing. Um, I am trying to put this together into a review that has been published. Um, my concentration advisor has been waiting for an abstract for the patient. So, um, <laughs> thank you for waiting. But um, I'm hoping to. Um, there is very, very little discussion within neuroscience about this data yet, and I don't think people know what to do with it yet, so I'm hoping to spur more conversation around changing the way that we think of a sexually dimorphic brain, of really incorporating um, an inherently gender spectrum and gender variant model into the way that we um, look at male and female test subjects within all health sciences. And then I'm hoping that um, we can see this theory move into practice um, real quick before I move on, I'm also doing um, a, a survey on non-binary trans mental health. So specifically, 
um, trans people that identify as non-binary who um, are desiring different amounts of physical transition. And just to put some statistics to some of the manifestations of lack of this knowledge within the medical sphere and the lack of care that is then being attributed to non-binary trans folks, I'm hesitant to give specific data because the data are still coming in, but we have 50 respondents so far, which is about three times as many as a normal trans study because it's often hard to find trans participants. But within this data, we see that um, close to 75% have self-harmed in their lifetime. Um, close to 90% have experienced significant thoughts of suicide in their lifetime. Um, I should have contacted one of these um, topics. I apologize, but we will be talking about it in the mental health panel next as well. Um, and 25% have been inpatient hospitalized for mental health related reasons. There's just this very robust manifestation of mental health outcomes that are coming as a result of providers not knowing how to address their patients of the, the stigma. I think one of the most significant um, statistics is that 67% of um, non-binary trans people in this survey avoided going to the, do to the doctor for fear of discrimination. And that's just something we have to think about. If the medical sphere is operating in a way that trans people are afraid to go to the doctor to get care that is very much a significant part of their lives, um, there's work we need to do. Transition, thank you. Uh, into the work that I've been focusing on, which is um, also primarily because folks with mental illness are uh, are free to use the services that we are providing them. Uh, so, great jumping off point. Uh, a little bit of background in 2013, I founded Project Let's as a nonprofit organization focusing. Um, back then primarily on raising awareness of mental illness um, and still beginning to provide peer support services, but we were primarily uh, looking at stigma and awareness raising as the, uh, the focal points and the key issues uh, that we needed to be addressing. Um, and in 2014, uh, the spring semester of my freshman year, uh, with a team of folks who began to really critically look at Brown's specific policies um, and structures within the institution that were creating uh, ableist policies, um, ableist practices that were not only um, impacting access to care, but quality of care, um, and what happened when folks were using those services. Uh, so we were really, uh, the next slide I'll show uh, kind of talks a lot about why increasing professional services isn't necessarily uh, the solution or the answer. Um, and the next year was primarily focusing on developing the peer mental health advocate curriculum uh, model that we now use at Brown. Um, and in 2017, are on our fourth training cohort uh, with over 70 PMHAs um, and over 65 students at Brown consistently working with the PMHA. Um, which we're really proud of, um, and also moving forward, uh, looking to expand to other universities and community spaces. So I've been able to validate some really great indicators of success with the PMHA model, which I'm excited to share with y'all. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, in most mental health organizations still today, the narrative discourse is um, focused on raising awareness. Um, and at first, as I was saying, that's what Let's do too. Um, but there's a unique issue with mental illness in that we label stigma um, as something kind of out there that we don't necessarily know where it's coming from. Um, but the shift for us to, to labeling it as ableism, um, having an ism, allows us to connect it to those structural, repetitive behaviors, um, repetitive systems that are perpetuating the way in which individuals are being treated or how they identify with having a mental illness. So that shift was really critical for us. Um, in addition, most folks think, you know, if we can just get someone on medication, if we can just get them in therapy, that will solve their problems. Um, but what we're seeing is that uh, that's just perhaps one of the first steps or one of the first kind of support systems that we can provide for someone. Um, in this uh, really critical survey that was 
um, that was produced in 2009. Uh, it surveyed folks who were kind of chronic suicide attendees who had not attempted suicide within the past 12 months and looked at what were the most important factors um, influencing that. And as you can see, the, the least influential at the bottom was a relationship with a mental health professional. Um, and some of the most influential factors were uh, disappointing support systems, family and friends, wanting to finish school, um, uh, hope and plans for the future. So thinking about um, contrasting that with some of the um, kind of exclusive policies that we're seeing, uh, more extreme policies of, of medical leave, um, and maybe having students leave those support systems, um, not necessarily stay as a student and keep that identity are kind of contradicting some of the critical um, resilience and support factors that we've been able to really verify that are, are keeping students um, mentally healthy, keeping them feeling that they have um, kind of that baseline of support. Um, so that, that shift has been, um, has been critical for us. And looking at uh, a shift from a medical uh, model that's really dominant uh, to a more social model of disability has been at the core of what we do as well. Um, medical model uh, is essentially what Ryan just talked about is how uh, the experience of, of being trans is now something that's been pathologized and medicalized um, with symptoms and a diagnosis and the process of going through the, the healthcare system in a very similar way. Um, with mental illness. And through that model, we often neglect the social factors and social uh, social structures that can uh, trigger, cause, influence mental illness. Um, and I like to think of it almost in, as a gun, in that the gun is uh, like biology or genetics, and that the trigger is the environment or perhaps a sexual assault or trauma or something that can can set that off or influence that. Um, and not for everyone, but more often than not, we're seeing that that influence. And also, when we're talking to students, we're seeing that they're oftentimes more impacted by, um, by how other folks are treating them, by the way that they can't interact with their professors or their relationships, as opposed to the, the <laughs> symptoms themselves of their, of their lived experience. Um, so looking at taking uh, a social model of saying that Perhaps I can't access this quality care, or perhaps uh, Brown University offers uh, therapists, but do they offer trans therapists or queer therapists or folks who are competent in providing care to uh, trans or queer students? And those are the types of questions that we're looking at answering. Um, and a few uh, other example I wanted to kind of tie in my lived experience. Um, I approached this work uh, as a sexual assault survivor, um, as someone who's lived with OCD for many years, um, and for myself, being diagnosed with PTSD, it's kind of difficult to accept um, that there's something perhaps uh, pathologically uh, wrong. Uh, in terms of the way I view uh, something that happened to me and that I'm kind of responding in an appropriate way uh, for something that was done to me. And we see a lot of, of similar situations, especially as Ryan was talking about with trans folks, we know that uh, for young adults, young trans adults who have the support of family and that validation, they're significantly less likely to attempt suicide. Um, so how can we say that there's something wrong with them? Um, so kind of shifting that ideology has been really huge for us. And when you acknowledge that, that social factors are, are a part of this, you can kind of tip the balance in your favor. You don't need to be a psychiatrist or a doctor to make change with, for mentally ill students, um, which is where the PMH model comes in. Um, so we train students with mental illness through a six-week program uh, to become counselors and advocates for their fellow students. Uh, their learning skills, like crisis support, crisis management, uh, teaching coping skills to their fellow students, what the mental health care system looks like at Brown. As many of y'all know, it's very desegregated. Um, you can use a lot of different services on campus, um, and you can easily fall through those gaps. So our PMHAs act as, as connectors and navigators of a lot of the resources on campus. Um, and those are the primary categories and areas that they're working in. We've had students working with their PMHAs for over a year and a half now. Um, we've had students write letters of appeal for individuals who weren't allowed back on medical leave, and then students um, were accepted with additional support. So really critical aspects of, of again, tipping the balance um, in individuals' favors. Uh, we're finding that most of the, the majority of these 
policies um, that we've identified as, as ableist are significantly impacting lower income uh, students of color, international students. Um, so while access may be the issue of accessing medication for students with privilege, um, for those most vulnerable students, access is something like education. So how can we keep students with mental illness at school um, accessing their education? And we know that 64% of students who leave college, um, it's due to a mental health related reason, and only 23% of those students are coming back. So who has access to something, um, the baseline education, and not just those medical supports that we're looking at. And lastly, um, again, going back to my own experience, my freshman, not freshman year, my senior year of high school, I was involuntarily hospitalized for disclosing um, certain aspects of my mental health narrative. Um, and <laughs> since then, I've had an extreme uh, resistance to using professional systems of care. Um, my senior year, I had a, a psychiatric episode where I needed support and reached out to one of my PMHAs. Um, this is literally the text conversation that we had and thinking about how drastically different it was um, and still is from the way that I interact with professional health care. Um, if I say that I'm self-harming or that I'm suicidal, it's immediately like, let's get you to the hospital or some type of um, really fear-mongered response. Um, and this PMHA remained calm, offered a variety of options and strategies, uh, did not force one on me, which was really um, important for, for my own uh, autonomy in that situation. Um, and again, address social factors primarily, so asking if I needed food, if I was alone at that time. Um, and this is kind of the way that we train our students to deal with crisis. And, a lot of our work on campus is, is helping students get to the hospital or navigating options in more uh, severe crisis situations <laughs> that, by and large, as a society, we've been really afraid to talk about. So I've been really um, most proud of the, the change in culture and the way in which we're talking about these issues and the discourse that's, um, that's happened on campus um, and thinking about how we can move forward and, and take, um, as Brian was saying, a lot of this is about what has academia done for the way that we're kind of doing our work or navigating our work. But for me, I feel almost the opposite, that um, I want to see a change in, in academia and professional systems based on um, the work that folks with lived experience um, are contributing and the labor that we're putting into providing support systems um, at the universities that we attend. So thank you. to talk about my thesis. It's titled, This is How We Win, a Qualitative Study of Vietnamese Nail Salon Workers in the Bay Area. And to kind of contextualize uh, where my motivations for this uh, research came from, um, it kind of comes out of the two-part expose uh, that the New York Times published in May 2015 on nail salon workers. Um, the author, Sarah Neer, um, kind of talks about uh, the nail salon industry through the labor lens, which is the first article, and the health lens. So uh, she characterized the nail salon industry as operating on a racial and ethnic caste um, that put Latinx workers at the bottom and Korean workers at the top. Um, she also collected stories from workers about the health effects that they believed were due to um, their work in the nail salon industry, and it uh, ranged from anecdotes about uh, breast cancer and miscarriages to um, like hand rashes and uh, respiratory infections. Um, I personally feel had a lot of uh, critiques about the articles themselves, even though they did generate a lot of media traction and attention. I felt um, I felt like her use, her methodologies were kind of problematic because she was this. A white reporter. Um, she conducted the interviews mostly through a translator, so a lot of the workers didn't speak English, um, and the interviews were translated. Um, and I felt like they painted a really specific image of victimhood for the workers. Um, and being the daughter of a nail salon worker, I was really motivated to do this research on my own and talk to nail salon workers and uh, see if I would find kind of like similar or different findings. 
So, um, in terms of methods, ah, here you go. In terms of methods, um, I grew up in San Francisco, so naturally I focused on the Bay Area. Um, I specifically look, talk to workers from San Francisco and Oakland. Uh, over the summer, I conducted ethnographic uh, research at two nail salons, and I collected oral history interviews from nail salon workers as well as community organizers. So, my thesis is uh, split into three chapters, and I kind of briefly want to touch on the fact that um, I think health and labor are actually very like intertwined, um, but as indicated by the way that the articles are split up by health and labor, I think there's a larger societal view of health and labor as like very distinct. So I do uh, use that same kind of framework to split up my chapters, um, but yeah, I wanted to touch on that. So in the health chapter, um, workers shared a variety of illnesses and ailments that they believe are caused by their work in nail salons, which uh, corresponded really well with the public health literature. Um, and um, they included, you know, exposure to dangerous chemicals in their work that would cause um, like skin rashes, um, as well as like respiratory problems and uh, allergies due to like breathing in really noxious chemicals um, daily. But I was most interested in workers and their mental health. Um, in one instance, I watched a customer kind of cry during their visit because they were talking about something really emotional and the worker had to um, console this customer. And so I became really interested in how emotional health uh, was impacted, was impacting workers because it's an uncompensated part of their uh, work that they're performing emotional labor. So I asked workers um, how that their emotional labor was affected by their work. And I found that um, not only did uh, their emotional labor affect their own mental health, but it also affected the mental health of their family. So a worker uh, named Nancy, same name as me, shared uh, how, quote, I've been feeling kind of sad, kind of depressed, and I think my son looks at me and he gets depressed too. Another worker, Michelle, shares how, I feel so depressed and I come home so stressful from work and I don't want to put a lot of anger to my family. They're innocent. So workers are put in the position of uh, taking on emotional labor at, health, at work that can take a toll on their own mental health as well as their families. In the labor chapter, um, I explore the labor relationships between workers, between workers and employers, and between workers and customers, and how those relationships um, affect how workers perceive their own exploitation. Um, one thing that I found really interesting was how workers uh, were sometimes um, policing, being policed for their language use. So a, a, the worker Michelle shares her experience with an employer that prohibited workers from speaking Vietnamese in the workplace. Uh, because many of the workers are recent immigrants, they rely on Vietnamese as, a, as their primary language of communication. Um, However, uh, employers sometimes discourage use of Vietnamese because they feel like uh, customers might think that they're being talked badly about. Um, so Michelle shares how uh, she was upset by this policy and uses her own English skills to stand up for her coworkers. So she shares, um, you wouldn't let your customer treat your employee this way, and it's not right. Without your employee, who would work for you? Who would take care of your, work, of your customers for you, right? So it's not right. Um, but it's up to you, and if she's wrong, I wouldn't let her do this again to me. I like this quote because I think Michelle is articulating her power as an employee, and she's recognizing that businesses wouldn't function without workers. So um, she leverages that power to um, push back against the owner's policy and to help other coworkers feel like uh, they can stand up for themselves too. So given uh, these different dynamics and issues that come with being a nail salon worker, I wanted to look at community organizing in my last chapter as the potential for uh, enacting change. So I look at the various uh, state policies that have been enacted that uh, affect nail salon workers, but I also look specifically at the work of um, the Oakland Nail Salon Organizing Project and the two queer Vietnamese uh, nail salon community organizers, uh, Tracy and Trang. So uh, Tracy and Trang are both um, fairly young community organizers. They're in their mid-20s. And I was 
really interested in how, uh, given their age difference uh, and their uh, difference in background, so they're both college educated, versus the workers who are uh, mostly in their 50s or 60s um, and came from uh, the second wave of refugees to the United States after the Vietnam War. I was interested in how those different identities would uh, push up against each other in their community organizing. So when I asked Trang how they approach coming, overcoming those barriers, Trang uh, shared, quote, I try to connect with them through a heart space. I do it in a playful space, but sometimes you also have to be vulnerable and connect with them. I shared my queerness with them. So I became interested in how, by being queer community organizers, um, they were able to uh, use their, the vulnerability uh, that came with um, those challenges to connect with the hardships that workers experience and the um, trauma that they might have carried from uh, being refugees of the war. So yeah, I think my thesis uh, presents some evidence for the importance of bottom-up uh, community organizing in um, making effective changes to labor. survival of Udelsi, as well as the other 14,000 other HIV carriers living on the island. And the time said that the intensity and the scale which with the Cuban Revolutionary Government has attacked HIV and AIDS was the reason why the country has been so successful as limiting the spread of HIV and AIDS. And during the mid-1980s and to the early 1990s, the National HIV AIDS Program centered on two aspects. It centered on a mass screening and sexual contact tracing program and a quarantine program. And indeed, you know, Cuba has been very successful because its HIV infection rate is about 0.1%, which is one sixth of the rate United States. And this rate is on par with those of more developed countries like Finland and Singapore. And recently, Cuba was the first country to end mother-to-child HIV and AIDS transmission. And from the viewpoint of scholars like Paul Farmer and Nancy Shepard Hughes, these, achieve these achievements are quite remarkable given that the island lacked access to advanced medical equipment because of the embargo imposed by the United States government. But then there are opposing opinions. Um, for instance, Radio Marti, which is a Cuban exile radio station, and perhaps the most vocal critic uh, of the revolutionary government did not agree with the assessment and say that there are ethics um, or it raises the question of ethics um, regarding the National HIV AIDS program. 
Specifically, it said that the Cuban government infringed upon the human rights of HIV carriers by forcibly isolating them in eight sanatoria. And Reyna Marti was not the only one to make this accusation. News agencies like the Chicago Tribune and the Washington Post have also made similar accusations, accusing the, gov the Cuban government of violating the human rights of HIV carriers. And the station also accused the Cuban government of lying about the origin of HIV AIDS, saying that HIV AIDS did not come from the United States, but rather HIV AIDS uh, was brought to the island via Cuban soldier returning from Africa um, following their uh, international lease of work. And in response to these accusations, the Dallas Castro, the then leader of Cuba, said that this accusation was groundless and was made with the intention to undermine the revolutionary government. And he, to back up his claim, um, he pointed to the country official HIV AIDS figures, saying that these figures were much lower than those of the United States and other so-called first world country. And while it was unclear, um, whether the allegation was true or not, and nor is it the intention of my thesis to figure this out. One thing is certain is that Castro and the, and the revolutionary government was concerned about these allegations, which begs the question of why. So in Cuba, public health is very intertwined with the politics around the revolution. Um, that is to say that public health was central to the country's anti-imperialist struggle, first against Spain, and then against the United States. In fact, one of the promises that Castro made during the revolution was to provide quality health care to all Cubans, a promise that he believed would bring Cuba closer to become a social society. And coupled with the fact that Cuba had been very successful at improving its own health, health outcomes, for instance, Cuba successfully um, eliminated dengue fever from the island, as well as its drastically reduced, reduced its infant mortality rate. Public health was quickly seen as a source of national pride, as well as the pillar of the revolution. And due to the already highly politicized nature of public health in Cuba, the allegation made by Rayo Marti regarding the role of the revolutionary government in the HIV AIDS epidemic presented a test not only for the healthcare system, but also for the legitimacy of the revolution. And quickly, the epidemic was politicized, which is a fancy term for when something became political in nature. But it's important to note that politicization here did not only stem from the back and forth debates between Rayo Marti and the Cuban government, but also from efforts taken by HIV carriers to reform the National HIV AIDS Program and to educate the public about HIV AIDS prevention. These carriers, they recognized that their individual right was being severely limited while living in quarantine. And because of their illness, there was a great deal of stigma attached to them. And so my thesis is, to under, is the focus of my thesis is thus to understand the causal mechanism behind these two process of politicization. Namely, how did HIV carriers, so first, the first question is how did the discourse between Rayo Marti and the Cuban government give rise and intensify <coughs> the transnational process of politicization? And the second question is, how did HIV carriers' effort to, continue to reform the national HIV AIDS program bring about the domestic process of politicizations? Um, and to conduct a study for these questions, um, I mainly look at um, newspaper articles uh, of Granma, which is Cuba leading news agency, um, broadcasts and reports written by Rayo Marti, official document released by the Cuban government, as well as stories or interviews collected by the New York Times of HIV carriers they interviewed on the island. So my, the first two chapters of my thesis is focusing on the origin of HIV AIDS transmission and the ethics of the National HIV AIDS Program. So the first two chapters focus on the discourse between Rayo Marti and the Cuban government. And in analyzing the debates of the origin of HIV AIDS transmission, and the ethics of the National HIV AIDS Program, I found that health serve a dual role in this debate. Um, from the viewpoint of Freya Moradi, health presented a test for the legitimacy of the national, oh sorry, the legitimacy of the revolution. Having recognized that public health was a pillar of the revolution, 
The Cuban exile radio station knew that by accusing the revolutionary government of misinforming about the origin of HIV AIDS, of the HIV AIDS epidemic, as well as infringing upon the rights of HIV carriers, it knew that it would put forth the idea that the revolutionary government had failed to fulfill the commitment to protecting the health of its people, a commitment that it made during the revolution. And in some, the station believed that these accusations would cast doubt on the legitimacy of the revolution of the revolution, as well as the legitimacy of the revolutionary government. But in response to the action of Rayo Martí, the Cuban government, however, saw HIV and AIDS as a validation of the legitimacy of the revolution. It's not the the government known that Cuba has acquired the status as the third world country with the first world health indicators. And so it was concerned about what this particular, what these accusations, um, what kind of damage that these accusations could have for the reputation of the government. Yet at the same time, it knew that the country has been very successful at containing the epidemic. And so it relied heavily on, the, on this fact, as well as the country HIV AIDS statistic, not only to counter these allegations, but also to defend the revolution. And, and through continuous back and forth debates, health, or specifically HIV and AIDS, became heavily embedded within the conversation around the legitimacy of the revolution, and health was consequent, or the HIV AIDS epidemic was subsequently politicized. And then my last chapter focuses on the story of HIV carriers. And in analyzing these stories and the interviews that was conducted by the New York Times, I found that HIV, contrary to the belief that HIV carriers was passive recipients of care, I found that HIV carriers was active participant in their own health care, not only questioning the model of care being provided to them, but also negotiating for their patient autonomy. At the time, Cuba was experiencing a severe economic crisis. And like any other Cubans, HIV carriers saw themselves as filling in the gaps created by the state rhetoric of health and social welfare and its inability to actually provide these services, a gap that was created by the extreme conditions of the economic crisis. As such, HIV carriers pushed public health officials to not only implement reforms that would prioritize their needs, but also to establish sex education campaigns that would destigmatize HIV AIDS and homosexuality. And in sum, they redefined HIV AIDS and transforming it into a site of, of contestations over the politics around health and sexuality on the island. And so why is this important? Um, the Cuban model of HIV AIDS prevention has received a lot of praise um, in that it was seen as quite success successful. Yet at the same time, the question of ethics has been raised many times. And since the, 19, since the early 1990s, the Cuban government has heavily depended on HIV carriers to reform the national HIV AIDS program, as well as to educate the public about HIV AIDS prevention. But there's still a lack of conversations regarding the role of HIV carriers in the way, in the, in the, in the conversation about how successful the program has been. So the purpose of my thesis is to showcase that, that HIV carriers play a large role in the politics around HIV and AIDS, and they should not be ignored as the passive recipient of cares that the Cuban HIV, sorry, that the Cuban government would like to, you know, portray. Thank you. question answer portion. So if anyone has questions, feel free to shoot them. <laughs> we can start with ours, and then if you have questions, yeah, Tristan. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a question for uh, Sarah. Uh, great job, everybody, uh, first of all. Um, so the kind of like the two pillars you talked about the most were kind of um, on like the education front, both uh, with the, the, the high schoolers and with NBA. Um but did you um, kind of ask any questions about from the like healthcare providers perspective within? I don't personally know how it works. Like, are there enough providers in a prison? Um, like the stigma of working in that environment. Um, like better ways to actually improve the the care to the inmates. Yeah. Um, so I think that 
I guess, that field, that area. Yeah, so, I mean, given just the huge prison population that the United States has, um, I guess you can argue that there will almost never be enough primary care doctors entering this field of work to provide enough care. Um, but beyond primary care, I think um, a huge barrier is also getting, um, like, psychiatry into the prisons. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I think the people who do choose to work in prisons, um, I think before, I think, so the professor that I work with, it's J Dr. Jennifer Clark, uh, she said that when she first started working like 30 years ago, um, it was people who weren't, um, who didn't get board certified that had mm -hmm. to work in prisons. So obviously they didn't want to be there. Um, now it's, it's different, um, though I, I do think there's a weird tension that exists um, with um, inmates, they often feel like they're not getting adequate care or, you know, they go for a back pain and they're given just like a Tylenol and not adequate care, but given just like the sheer number of patients that the doctors have to see, um, it's just like not possible at all to, you know, give them the time that they, they, that they deserve. So that's, that's a huge issue. Thank you so much for all your presentations. I've learned so much in the last hour or so. Yeah. Um, but I have a question for Steph um, in regards to the PM PMHAs and like kind of that training model and stuff. I was wondering um, what kind of like peer support um, the PMHAs get because it like kind of seems to me like it's a very kind of intensive work and kind of how they how they might get support too. Yeah, so we definitely, um, that is considered at every step of the process. And we, as an organization, have like a really strong idea from the get-go of like, you make the, like we never require like, for the training, we need folks to like be present and things of that nature, but we never require people to be like showing up places that they can't do that or the type of um, involvement and engagement with LUTs is completely individualized in that respect. So people don't have that pressure of like, like, oh my God, like I made this commitment, I have to like stick this out. And we kind of keep reiterating at every step, like it's okay if you can't finish the training, you can come back to doing the training, you can have access to the resources. If you need to, you wanna work with one or to three peers, um, you can take time off. So really making it kind of accessible to like opting out is the first thing. Um, and then second, while they're working in the program, we have weekly meetings where PMHAs are interacting with each other and um, <laughs> talking about like seeking advice and support from other PMHAs um, in relation to their peer, but also themselves. And kind of um, while we're kind of working on activism or counseling, there's always the baseline of like the reason we're here and like building the community is for each other and for ourselves. Um, and having uh, most PMHAs have a PMHA, which <laughs> kind of this cyclic, like, <laughs> uh, never-ending PMHA cycle. Um, yeah, but we all kind of have uh, a go-to PMHA that, that we can reach out to for support. Um, and I think that they're, the last thing is that for so many of us, having this role and responsibility, um, it's something called like helper therapy principle. Like it actually is something that's helpful um, for our well-being to feel like um, or having that, that socialization or that like human interaction and uh, kind of being validated by um, like being like useful and being meaningful in a relationship or in someone's life. Um, and we actually had like a, a hangout of like PMHs like outside of like a meeting space. And for some of us, it was like the first time we like socialized in like over a month. So like we have different, uh, different ways and different pathways to make sure that we're all kind of being accounted for um, and people are, again, free to interact with the space um, and the group uh, what, for what's most comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that a lot of you guys are looking at sort of how individuals and these broader social systems are interacting and you all also seem to have a very particular like geographic focus. And I'm just wondering in terms of addressing these myriad healthcare issues uh, nationally, I guess, is, is there a best approach? Uh, I think some of you advocated for more activism or others ad advocated for more of like an educational approach. And I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts were, I guess, in terms of that. Open to the panel. <laughs> as we all know, as um, 
persons who interact with the United States in different ways. Like every different state and region has its own subset of culture and like political and cultural beliefs that goes with that. I personally grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and I have no plans of going back there to do trans activism anytime soon because I just don't think I can be safe there as a trans person in general. Um, and it's one of the regions <laughs> in the U.S. that needs the most help, but I just don't feel like I'm ready to go back and do that work safely. So my geographic focus is in the coastal regions that are primed and ready for this kind of activism <coughs> reform that could respond to the theory, because I don't want to present you know, scientific theory and give queer theory to persons who are just going to respond with Leviticus quotes and, and things like that, um, which does happen in Omaha um, public school board meetings. Um, so that's what I'm thinking about right now. But we also want to make sure we're expanding to just a non-US centric focus as well. Um, and I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about that. Um, not as much focus on an international, uh, I guess, look. But my, my whole thesis, actually, I only presented on parts of it. But um, I know that. And it, I think it's actually a combination of all of these. Um, so, so it's a combination of activism, it's a combination of education, of changing bureaucratic structures. Um, I look at education really heavily um, in my thesis and looking at the way that like textbooks and um, continuing ed talks about um, race and issues of um, class in the way that uh, they teach midwives. So I think it's definitely a combination of all the different ways that we're all approaching these um, issues. Yeah. I think for me as well, I um, did work in uh, Bhavan, Swaziland for two months this past year, and I'll be going back um, later next year. Um, but for, for us and for lots, it's always been really important to not have, not just be providing services to people who have like the privilege to attend to attend an American university or an Ivy League college for that matter, um, but even looking at like shifting the model from uh, an Ivy League school to a community college, like it's drastically different. Um, so for me, I just look at like the key critical pieces of what we're doing, like mobilizing people with lived experience who don't have professional expertise, and then like you have that baseline and you can work on kind of uh, uh, making it culturally and socially specific in a variety of different arenas. Um, but I think it's really important to, if you kind of have that baseline to not keep trying, like reiterating, figuring out um, the like baseline solution in different places and, and kind of working from, from there and starting, um, like I think one of the things that's been most difficult in all of like activism work is the development of just like so many task forces and meant so many like places to discuss the problem and not acting on it. So kind of having that baseline knowledge and allowing as many different communities to act on it in their way is part of my goal. Yeah, I think in terms of labor, um, there are definitely ways that uh, it can be like applied to a broader geographic context. Like I think culture shifts about um, what workers feel like they deserve or what we feel like is like just for workers. I think there's definitely ways for like education or like awareness to um, attack those avenues. But I think my research shows that there's also an importance to location specificity and um, different communities I think have different needs. Um, so having workers be able to like articulate that for themselves in like the places that they're the communities that they're a part of I think is really important um, and I don't think that labor organizing at least in the Vietnamese community is at a place yet um, that it, that could take place nationally um, I think that might be something further down the road but as of now yeah definitely like very community focused um, as, as for me, while I was analyzing the stories of HIV carriers, I think location specificity is really important to uh, my analysis because like Cuba is as a communist state is very much thought of as a top down type of country where like unless the government or the state um, 
decide is the right time to change a certain policy. Like there's a lot of the perceptions that there's, you know, that the people have no power over their own healthcare and that the state is up to dictating the type of healthcare that being provided to them. Um, but I think through analyzing the story and like through my research, I show that like this, you know, is not always the case. And that in the story of HIV carriers, they very much push a reform. They push. They use relationship. They use their relationship with the doctors as a way to leverage for reforms, to leverage for the type of care they want, but also for the type of education campaigns that they hope you know the public will receive. So I think that you know even in a communist country, like the state is not always the one that is doing the work um, or is the one who's dictating the type of or choosing the type of care that's being provided. And I think also reiterating Sage's point, I'm a huge fan of, of local change and thinking about everything in systems. So you can't just think oh, there's like one best solution for everything, like education or like health. Um, I think to sh like shape a system or shift it, you have to like attack it from like multiple angles. So for prisoners, <laughs> there's even creative ways like arts education uh, for prisoners to help them understand their identities and. Um, you know, there's education for the public, for the for the inmates as well. There's even things like providing free transportation to hospitals. So I think like thinking uh, locally, you know, each system of prisoners' health, depending on the location and the laws in place in each state and the you know private versus um, you know governmental prisons, um, like all these systems are so different that you kind of have to think locally. Also, it's kind of funny that we are talking about. Um, health inequality, but none of us have like, really directly talked about public health or super public health <laughs> oriented. Um, but I think I'm taking a class in LGBT public health right now. That's what I'm doing my non-binary trans survey for. Um, and in reading literature on um, trans health and kind of like trans health predeterminants in um, the United States, about 50% of the um, those surveys take place in San Francisco or New York, maybe even more than that, like 70%. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that kind Sometimes of just, Minnesota, we could a pocket. yeah, I haven't seen any from Minnesota, but I will, I will search. Old that. ones often, yeah, the sure. first clinic. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Um, but the, so I guess my opinion about public health is that it's so, so, so important in order to, we talk about, um, theory of human practice, but we also need data that informs practice. And, um, the end of all of these studies on these qualitative trans, Focus studies in um, trans women of color or sex workers in San Francisco or um, trans women of color in New York and their resilience and survivability. They always just say, we need more of these. We need more in other geographic locations so we can know what's happening in trans communities outside of these hyper liberal urban cities. Um, so we just need more studies across the board. Um, I have a question for Nancy. Really I think most of you can probably answer this. Um, but since you like talked about like victimization, I'm just wondering how you um, balance like talking about very real issues that male salon workers face, but also like their like resilience and strength as they're like going through these issues. Yeah, I think that's a really good question because um, as I was working through my thesis, I was very concerned about not reproducing like the same kind of problems that I saw in the New York Times article, um, and I think. One way that I kind of navigated that was to focus on using like oral histories as my methodology. Um, so rather than really like focusing on using like a structured or a semi-structured like interview schedule where I I would ask workers like questions that I wanted to know, I really focused on moments that workers uh, wanted to share with me. So I focused a lot on um, what were their most memorable. Um, experiences in their time as nail salon workers and also focused on um, sharing my own experiences with my mom and uh, just like growing up and my own perspectives about um, nail salon work and in that way I think uh, workers had I think more agency in, in what they wanted to share and what would empower themselves like uh, that they felt like they wanted other people to know about their work um, and I think in writing my thesis I also tried not to share stories that, uh, for like, for the sake of like sensationalizing the issue, or just stories that I felt like, oh yeah, people would like want to know about this. Um, but rather, I felt like stories that could speak to a larger collective narrative, or um, something that I felt like could contest what was um, 
being put out about nail salon workers at large? I don't know if that answers your question. Does anyone else want to take on an aspect, not specifically on this side? Of that question before you're taking it? I could briefly say something. I think, like, because of the way in which uh, mental illness has like, been, like, demonized in certain ways, like, there's a push to, like, completely shift that language. Um, I think a good example is probably, like, sexual assault um, and, like, survivors and the way we've switched from victim to survivor. And, like, there's a lot of discourse around, like, like the good survivor who, like, you know, then gets involved in activism and is able to, like, file their report and, like, kind of... Doing, doing those steps um, and having like just the experience of being like like you were just assaulted like maybe victim feels like the right word like maybe you're not ready to like report it and like take all these actions but just like are having this experience and I I see in mental um, in like mainstream mental health discourse the push to like go to like like the good survivor or the person who is kind of um, you know, not defined by their mental illness or their disability and, like, just want to push back and have the nuance of, like, someone who is defined by their mental illness or who kind of does um, acknowledge the weight of what they're dealing with and doesn't need to, like, find that inspirational aspect of that experience. So I think there's a, a really important balance between, um, like, those two narratives. One, one more thought I forgot to add um, is that I think I think my thesis also shows that we should care about like low wage workers or like nail salon workers not just because like their stories are like make us feel something emotionally um, like make us feel bad but also just that like that it's like unjust right so like a lot of the workers I talk to like they don't necessarily share the same type of narratives that the New York Times like chose to portray but even if they find like their working conditions like completely acceptable due to like internalized ideas about like you know uh, what what workers should be paid I think we should still care about those issues um, so yeah yeah I have a question for Sarah um, I was wondering if you know why the pharmaceutical company that makes Nevada is their cred, um, why do they provide to uh, other patients for free? I guess I'm just like skeptical that it's an altruistic reason, but I was wondering if you knew why like logistically that happened. Yeah, so we were also confused at first too. This was like too good to be true. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, when it was approved by the FDA four years ago, they expected it to be like this huge thing that like, you know, would be like groundbreaking and like everyone would want it. But surprisingly, like no one knows about it still. And so um, by doing this, this is also kind of, I think that they're trying to like get the word across, you know, once more people are on it, they'll tell their friends and be like, hey, there's this thing. So I, I think it's also still like capitalistic. So, yeah. I can add to that. I, from that old school, they capped up after this. So and a lot of that is tied to the way that the drug companies are giving out HIV drugs is to tie to uh, activism of your that really held the drug companies accountable for the pricing of life-saving drugs and medication. So it's like a post hoc atonement for that. <laughs> Hi, yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. I had questions specifically for Dee and for Nancy. Um, so for Nancy, I'd be interested in hearing about, because you talked a little bit in relation to the New York Times piece about uh, race in relation to the uh, sort of experience of these sales salon workers. And so I'd be interested in hearing more about uh, what the role was of like racialization and this day for some of these nail salon workers uh, and sort of the, how they're thinking about health and labor um, as well as organizing, especially since they might have different experiences in relation to immigration and things like that. Um, and then for V, I was thinking about, um, so it seems like the United States is starting to uh, do more normalization in relationship with uh, Cuba's government, which would seem to change some of how they might think about, uh, I don't know, their sort of legitimacy as a government. Um, and so I was wondering how you feel like that would uh, change some of their approach to uh, what it is that public health relationship is to their government's legitimacy if they don't have to fight the United States for that legitimacy. 
for your questions. I think I heard like three-ish questions. So um, the first question, I guess, is like how uh, the, how nail salon workers themselves are racialized. Um, and in another presentation that I did on my thesis, I showed uh, two videos. Um, so I think, well, the first video is like from this comedian, Angela Johnson, and her uh, piece about nail salon workers. And in it, she kind of like uses this uh, Vietnamese accent and like portrays nail salon workers with like a very specific personality and I think that extends to like other examples as well um, so I think in general a lot of portrayals of nail salon workers are that they're Asian even specifically that they're Vietnamese and 70% um, of nail salons in California are owned by Vietnamese people so I think there's and there's a very specific reason for why that ethnic niche has kind of formed um, it has to do with basically how like um, Vietnamese Americans, like Vietnamese people, arrived to the U.S. Uh, after the Vietnam War, and like due to uh, other little other like economic opportunities and the existence of the licensing exam in the Vietnamese language, it kind of facilitated a lot of workers entering the industry. And the industry relies really a lot on um, recent Vietnamese immigrants um, to kind of sustain itself. So. In that way, there are so, there is some truth to the fact that a lot of Vietnamese work, a lot of nail salon workers are Vietnamese. But at the same time, my research found that uh, sometimes this made it really difficult for nail salon workers who, like, for first of all, were maybe not good at nail salon work, like, found it really challenging because it's actually incredibly difficult if you've ever tried. Um, Painting nails is like really hard, um, and it's not something that just like Vietnamese people are inherently good at. Um, so for workers that found it found the work challenging, it became really difficult to find other economic opportunities because people in the community would discourage them from looking for other work, um, basically saying that you know you're not going to find any other work that's suitable for you. You don't speak English, and language became a huge barrier as well to accessing education or, um, yeah, other opportunities. Um, in terms of racialization just in the, in the nail salon itself, um, the nail salons that I was uh, conducting my field work in mostly had um, like middle class white women as their clientele. Um, but in the <coughs> nail salon, salon organizing project, a lot of the workers uh, worked in salons that uh, serviced um, African Americans in East Oakland. So uh, the the, nails, the organizing project actually um, conducted this exchange with African American women and Vietnamese women, where they came together over the, the series of two years um, and had conversations about um, each other and their own identities and kind of their histories in order to facilitate uh, cross racial solidarity. So I found that organizing became a really um, important avenue for um, building cross-racial solidarity in East Oakland. Um, but I think that uh, you, you are right that workers have very different conceptions of what community activism is. So for some workers, they found that health became an important avenue for advocacy work, um, either due to their own experiences with health. So I talked to a worker that um, experienced breast cancer, and because of that experience, she became really involved in advocacy work for removing toxic chemicals from um, nail salon products, um, whereas other workers uh, saw labor as a more conducive avenue for advocacy work. So for example, like the story I shared from Michelle. But I think that also has to do with the specific like uh, immigration histories of the workers. So workers that I think came from um, the, immediately after the Vietnam War had very negative um, uh, negative like a not a negative relationship with um, the communist regime in in Vietnam. So they viewed health as less politicized than labor because uh, labor with its language around like unity and solidarity and like organizing I think was viewed as a lot more political and socialist in ideology and that became read as like communist and therefore bad. Um, so I think that became a challenge for community organizers to get workers to open up about their experiences with labor exploitation and 
use that as an uh, as an avenue for advocacy. So I think those are there are a lot of complicated relationships, but I hope I answered your question. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think I when I was writing the conclusion for this thesis, I, I was wrapping my head around like what we, what does legitimacy legitimacy means now. Um, I mean, what does public health mean to Cuba now, given that Cuba is normalizing relationship with the United States? And I think that even prior to the normalization, Cuba, I think, has already solidified its status as like the country with one of the world best healthcare system. Because since the 2000s, Cuba has, has a booming health tourism industry where a lot of uh, citizens of countries in Latin America and Caribbean would travel to Cuba for um, surgical procedures that they would not receive in their country or that the procedure would be cost way too much and they would rather go to, go to Cuba instead. And in fact, some people in the United States would travel to Cuba um, to get treatment as well. And, as, and also Cuba has been training doctors from Africa and from other countries in Latin America as well as sending doctors on missionary trips to these countries. Whether these missionaries do have political nature in them or not is another question, but I think Cuba, for the most part, has already seen public health as very much legitimizing the revolution. But also, I think the legitimacy of the revolution is also becoming less important to the Cuban government when it shifts, the leadership is shift from Fidel Castro to Raul Castro. The Raul will focus more on like economic inequality and like not so much economic, sorry not economic inequality, but imp of improving the country economic growth and expanding the country um, free market economy. So he's the one who introduces like Cuba to you know free free market economy, and he was the one who to um, allow citizens to privatize their property holding and like be able to sell their property to each other as well as to foreigners. So I think in, in, in the context of Cuba today, I think the conversation about the legitimacy of public health is becoming less important for the reason that public health has already been very much solidified within the country rhetoric on, around the revolution, but at the same time, the rhetoric around the, revol around the revolution has become less important to the government. It's still there because it's part of what gives the revolutionary government its authority, but at the same time, the focus is much more on improving the country economically. Yeah, I think that's Maybe we'll finish up in this. Yeah, we were trying to end by one thirty. So, yeah, thank you everyone yeah, for coming. Thank you.